what an incredible uh, couple of years for us. Uh, we've uh, three wins at the Supreme Court. Um, I think last year alone we had over 6,000 interviews and stories we were in. We've got two cases sitting at the Supreme Court right now. Another one is about to be on its way. I mean, uh, incredible. And so I want to talk a little bit today, kind of like I'm a scout from the front lines, and my job is to kind of tell you what's going on and what I see coming. Uh, and I want to talk about that, but I know I need to start because not everybody in here even knows what I'm talking about. First Liberty, what's that? So let me start with the basics real quick, and then I'll, I'll move towards uh, an update. Uh, First Liberty is the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom. So if you're Daniela Barca and you're a young girl in school uh, up in the Northeast and you just want to start a Bible club and you're told, well, you can start a club, but you can't talk about Jesus or the Bible in your club at school. Uh, you know, what is Daniela going to do? Take $100,000 out of the bank, go hire a team of attorneys. Uh, so we come in, we bring litigators, the best in the country, they all donate their time, uh, so that when we win, which we did for Daniela, we don't just win for Daniela, but we win for all of our kids and our grandkids with the precedent we set, and we all benefit from that. So that's what we do. But I think a, an important place uh, to start is why should you care about this? Why should you care about religious freedom? People who aren't believers don't understand a lot why they should care. But I'll be honest with you, most believers have about this much understanding of why they care. We tend to think, I want religious freedom because I want to be able to do what God wants me to do. That's a very small understanding. If you, and people are starting to get a better understanding. When you see Marxism start to creep into our country, and you look at what happened in other countries, okay? Marxism has to remove the church. That's, that's what, it's a competing philosophy. It's a competing, competing religion. And when it does, the evil that comes is unbelievable, right? Millions of people usually die. So this is not just about our ability to talk about our faith. This is even broader than that. This is about evil and what kind of evil. Because if you can't speak the truth, you can't speak against evil. And so this is the battle we're in. There's a, there's a great, uh, you know, the best way I can describe this is um, uh, I go all the, all the way around the country. And... I have people come up to me all the time that say, I'm not a person of faith like you, but I'm from Czechoslovakia. I'm from Hungary. I'm from, and I saw this happen in my country. They took down the religious symbols, and within a month, we all lost our political freedoms. And they hand me checks, 5,000, 10,000, whatever they say, I'm going to be involved with you guys from now on. And they're not even a person of faith. They just want their freedoms. Because they understand that the one thing that totalitarianism will never allow are citizens who hold an allegiance to one higher than the government. So whenever that type of an oppressive regime starts to come in, the first flashpoint is always religious freedom. And if you lose there, you'll lose everything. You'll lose all your freedoms. And again, as I said, evil will come in. There's a, there's a great book that if you haven't read, I'd, I'd highly encourage you. It's called Live Not By Lies by Rod Dreher. And what this book talks about is it talks about it kind of interviewed people from uh, the former Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, etc. People who lived under communism that are now alive in the United States that every single one of them said they're terrified at what they're seeing right now in the United States because it's what they saw in their country. And the question you ask yourself is, what do you do against this? How do you defeat this? And the answer is, live not by lies. It's Alexander Solzhenitsyn's last essay before he was banned from Russia or the Soviet Union. And uh, in it, he says, look, all these totalitarian regimes exist because everybody goes along with the lies. But if enough people, not a majority, just enough people stand up and speak the truth, they will suffer. They might not get that job, certain careers not be, not be allowed. That's not happening today, is it? Okay. Uh, they might not get certain educational opportunities. Uh, they, you know, you, you go on and on. You're going to suffer. But if enough people do that, the system collapses. And you see the stories in this book of person after person after person who does that, and you watch what happens in the country. I mean, people like a 16-year-old girl, I'm thinking of one of them in the book, who was told, if you speak the truth, you die. She spoke the truth. She had a death sentence. Well, she's still alive at 81, and she watched communism collapse because enough people like her stood up and spoke the truth. And so, you know, and look, I don't have to tell you, your pastor's already become famous for, he's a poet. 
uh, for speaking the truth into the culture where nonsense is being talked about. And nobody, everybody's wondering, is anybody going to say the truth? So, now, we don't have to look. At what I'm talking about, we don't have to look very far. When I say religious freedom is like, if you lose it, you lose everything. And it's kind of at the very core. Our founders called it our first freedom for a reason. I, we don't have to look very far. We just had an experiment with this. It was called COVID. It was called the pandemic. When all of a sudden these governors and mayors get this power they've never had, what was the flashpoint we just saw? What was the big constitutional issue? It was churches and synagogues being shut down all over the country. You could go to your Home Depot, but you couldn't go to church for an hour on Sunday. You could go to the marijuana dispensary. You could go to the liquor store, and we could keep going. But the one place that's not safe is your church. Uh, no rationale for that. So we knew going into this pandemic that this is going to be hard. That um, these people would have power, and when people get power, as Lord Acton says, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we knew it was coming, and we knew it was going to be very difficult. There's no precedent in the history of our country in a pandemic under the First Amendment for religious freedom. There's just no cases either way. So this is going to be all new. And think of it, you go into a court with a judge, and on one side, the mayor, the governor, whoever it is, they say, um, I'm trying to save millions of lives. You're the judge. You don't want to risk that. So it's going to be very hard to get a victory. So we knew we had to be very careful, and so we prayed a lot. And we had hundreds of churches and synagogues coming to us with outrageous situations. And finally, right before Easter, about a year ago, we got a call from a church, On Fire Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And they said, look, uh, we, we just wanted to do something where we could come together for Easter, but a way that would be safe. So we came up with this idea of meeting in our cars in the parking lot. And the radio frequency, the pastor would preach and we could all hear. And I'm not an expert like Fauci. Of course, I don't know if Fauci's an expert either. Um, but I don't think you pass the coronavirus from one automobile to another. And yet, Louisville, the city of Louisville, Kentucky, where this church was, said that we are going to criminally prosecute you if you show up in your car at the church. And then the governor said, we're going to watch, we're going to send police officers to every church in the state this Easter weekend. Any parking lots that have cars, we're going to write the license plate down. You will be visited at your home by a police officer and you will be quarantined for 14 days. At that point, we said, we're now in China. This is the case. And so we filed a lawsuit in federal court asking for an immediate emergency injunction on Good Friday, a little over a year ago. We got a great judge, Judge Justin Walker, who's since been elevated to the Federal Court of Appeals uh, at, in the D.C. Circuit, which is the highest in the country. And he wrote, you ever want to read a fun opinion to read? Read that one. Because he started out by saying, I am writing about something I never thought I would even read in some sort of dystopian novel or some horror film. Uh, a city in the United States has criminalized the celebration of Easter. And he begins to light into this country was built on religious freedom. This is irrational. It's ir unreasonable. It's unconstitutional. And this is not what we do in the United States of America. And he laid the wood to these people. Uh, and it was, we called it the shot heard around the world, kind of like the revolution. Because every, if you remember at this time, what we were seeing on TV images were a father throwing a baseball with his son in a park being handcuffed. A guy walking off the beach all by himself with a surfboard being arrested. And everybody was wondering, has the Constitution been suspended? And this said, oh no, it's not suspended. The Constitution is still in place. So this is a really important first victory for our country. But the goal wasn't to just get people in cars in their church parking lots. So our next case was Tabernacle Baptist Church. This is a church in a rural area of Kentucky. Very few COVID cases. Had plenty of room to socially distance, to do everything safe. Much safer than the other places people were allowed to go. And yet it was criminal for them to have anybody in their service. So we filed a lawsuit, and by the end of the lawsuit, not only uh, 
was it us on behalf of this church, but the Attorney General of the state of Kentucky, a great guy by the name of Daniel Cameron, uh, joined us in suing his own governor on behalf of the rest of the churches, and we ended up with a statewide injunction opening every church in the state to meet in person in a safe way. Just two weeks ago in Massachusetts, we had the governor there who had had restrictions. You could, do, you could go to any business you wanted, but you were limited to 90 people at your church service on Sunday. The only place limited like that. So we filed a, a legal action, and two days later, the governor decided that he was going to take away his limitations, and now all the churches this Sunday are meeting back with full capacity if they so want. So... The, we had case after case. We've won every case during the pandemic. But the problem is we still are in the middle of a battle because none of these cases have made the Supreme Court for a merits decision. So there's no precedent at a high level that's going to, I mean, we're still literally in a battle over whether the government controls our churches. So this is the kind of thing going on. But these battles aren't just going on in COVID. I mean, we have, uh, uh, we just won a case uh, about jurors. So we had a juror who was kicked off the federal jury by the federal judge because he said he was going to rely upon the Holy Spirit in his determinations. So evidently, you can take the oath of office, but if you believe it, you're kicked off the jury. So help you God. We went to the Federal Court of Appeals. You Normally, you get three judges. This time, it was a very special case. When they say something's really important, all 11 judges sat at one time to hear the case. And we just won this case that you cannot throw people off a jury because they're going to rely upon the Holy Spirit, not in the United States. Um, we're seeing attacks against uh, uh, synagogues across the country. We have synagogues in New York and L.A. and uh, uh, Houston. We just won one in Dallas where they're just trying to meet and have synagogue. So these are the kind of things happening that you wouldn't think you would have to worry about, but that show you the state of the attacks on religious liberty that we're dealing with. Uh, we have attacks on schools. A lot of you probably saw this last week all over the national press. A young lady in, uh, in Michigan, in Hillsdale, Michigan, uh, by the name of Elizabeth Turner, was a valedictorian. But they said, but you've got to remove this part of your speech that mentions God or Jesus because those kinds of things are inappropriate for public settings. Excuse me? A, personal, uh, a valedictorian address is a personal farewell. She has every right to personally express her religious beliefs especially when she's talking about the bigger things in life and what people need to think about. Um, this, I th I'm thankful for Elizabeth. She stood her ground. She stood up. We stood with her. And just, uh, I, think, I guess, two, two days ago now, uh, the school has backed down, and she is going to give her valedictory address, and she is going to mention God and Jesus in that address. <laughs> and, of course, a lot of you know about uh, um, uh, the situation we have with Coach Kennedy the coach who was fired for going to a knee to say a prayer after the football game. We've gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, all the way back down. Now we're going all the way back up again. Coach Kennedy's been going through this a long time, and I thought you might want to see a little two-minute uh, uh, statement from him on how he's doing in the middle of all this. This is where it happened. Uh, the game had just ended. Some players were celebrating a victory. Others were mourning the loss. And that's when a coach walked from the sidelines all the way to this spot and took a knee. That 15 seconds got that coach fired. Welcome to Bremerton, Washington, across the Puget Sound from Seattle. Everywhere you look, you see sparkling water, tall trees, and snow-capped mountains. It's also the focal point of a case the First Liberty Institute has been pursuing for years. We represent Coach Joe Kennedy, who's here with us. Hey, Joe. Hey. As you look around this field, you got to have a lot of memories here. Yes, i got a million of them. How long were you a coach? I was a coach here for eight years, yeah. eight and, and a half years. In your mind's eye, what do you see from those eight years you look around this stadium? A lot of, you know, great memories. Uh, the families, you know, the kids uh, being part of their lives and, you know, just being part of something, it was it was awesome. You were interested in doing more than just teaching them the X's and O's and run here and turn left. You wanted to build character into these boys. That was the most important thing to me. I, I never really wanted to focus on X's and O's. I, I think I went uh, eight and a half years without knowing a single offensive play. I, <laughs> I, I was a coach that didn't know anything about, about football, but I knew about character and team building 
and you know discipline and, and mental toughness how do you get the most out of them and that was my passion that was my joy of of my life was to actually help those guys so then it came down to that night when you knew they were watching you what was going through your mind when you said here i go i'm going out right out there to that 50 yard line i'm going to take a knee you know that almost like uh a uh, sickening feeling that that you have when you know something is final you know it it's I was walking out there and I realized that this is probably the last time I'm ever going to walk onto this field as a coach and that's what it came down to was that final moment and you know yeah I I I, I don't even know how to explain that because it was Everything faded. There was there was nothing else. There was nobody in the stands. There was no kids around knowing that that was it. And I'm going to lose my job by doing this. So I had to have some kind of faith there that it was all going to work out. Well, we are proud of you, and we're proud to represent you in the uh, in the battle in the courtroom. And uh, we're we're cheering you on to victory, Joe. I, I couldn't do it without you guys. <laughs> You know, I, I would have been lost. I would have been just some guy that got fired uh, if I didn't have all the people supporting me and, you know, First Liberty representing me. I, none of this would have been possible. Except for five, man. Hoorah. So we've got attacks in our schools, whether it be a coach, whether it be a student. We've got attacks on our seniors, I think. Uh, last time I was here, I mentioned to you this uh, case we had with Ken Haugie. We got lots of cases like this. Ken Haugie was a minister for 80 years, um, and, or 80-year-old minister for much of his life, and uh, was in a retirement uh, facility uh, and with a lot of other people, some of whom couldn't get out. And they came to him and they said, would you do a Bible study once a week so we can have a, some sort of a religious you know, interaction? And he said, sure, there's a common area room. I'll use, we're happy to use that. And he put in to use it like everybody else. And they said, well, you can use it, but not if you're going to have a Bible study. And he's, you know, 80-year-old guy who's just shocked, never seen anything like that in his life. He says, all right, well, I'll just hold it in my, my apartment. He then received a letter from them saying that he would be evicted if he held a Bible study in his own apartment. And uh, he had to go through 12 hours of depositions, all kinds of harassment. You've never seen anything like this. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. There's now a permanent online place that says Bible study every Wednesday night that will never go away as a result of the lawsuit. Uh, uh, and he did win his lawsuit. But we're, we're having to fight these across the country. Just people just having a right to get together and study the Bible. Uh, attacks on seniors, attacks on and school, uh, attacks uh, on people trying to run their business according to their faith. I think uh, everybody remembers Melissa Klein. It's probably one of the better examples, I think. Here's a Here's somebody who made baked goods. Everybody said she was good, and eventually it got big enough where she could do her own storefront. And her dream was to pass that on to her five kids. And she did a great job uh, and had two uh, 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 same-sex couple women come and say, we want to buy baked goods. And she loved them, sold them, had no problem with that. And then they said, we want you to make a, a custom wedding cake for our wedding. Well, she, she didn't do a lot of custom cakes, but when she did them, they were all biblically focused scripture and on, on, on her approach with that. So she said, oh, I'm sorry I can't do that because of my faith, but I'll, I'll refer you to somebody who would do a great job. The next thing she knew, the state of Oregon was coming after her. Uh, she was fined $135,000. Her business was bankrupted. She was ordered not to speak publicly her beliefs about marriage because it might cause mental anguish to the two plaintiffs in the lawsuit. Uh, and there started her battle. And now it's been, I think, at least probably seven years We've been all the way, and she lives in Oregon, uh, not exactly a conservative state. So they said, oh, free speech? We don't see any free speech violations. We can force you to say whatever we want to. Uh, free exercise? Oh, we don't see any free exercise violations. So we took it to the Supreme Court. The court vacated the decision below, sent it back down and said, maybe you want to look at religious freedom this time. Kind of not a subtle hint. Uh, so we re-argued the case, and now a year later, we're waiting for another opinion. She's been going through this this whole time. Why? Because she knows that millions of people are depending upon what happens in her case so they can run their business according to their faith. 
Uh, so we're seeing these attacks in, in all kinds of ways. Probably the last way I'll mention because it's Memorial Day weekend is in our military. Um, again, we have numerous cases in our military. Uh, we just had to file one a couple of weeks ago with a chaplain who they're trying to throw out of the service after all of his years. Why? What did he do as a chaplain? He mentioned something religious on his personal Facebook page. Pretty outrageous, right? He mentioned some, he, he, he mentioned that he was in agreement with President Trump's policy on transgenders in the military, and he expressed his religious beliefs why. He did that at the time President Trump was President Trump. So he agreed with the commander-in-chief, but now that we have new people, they think that that should disqualify him from ever serving in the military again because as a chaplain, he agreed with the commander-in-chief and expressed a religious thought on his own Facebook page. Well, that's outrageous, and we're representing him, and we're not going to stop until they stop the attempt to destroy his career. Uh, and, of course, a lot of you have probably heard about Shields of Strength, which is uh, Kenny Vaughn, great guy, uh, came up with the idea uh, because he was a, he was a national champion uh, water ski jumper, and he would get scared. And his girlfriend, now his wife, uh, said, why don't you put scripture verses? And he started putting some things on his wrist and, you know, and it helped him. And so he came up with the idea to put it on a dog tag. And the next thing you know, you can't go now to any branch, any unit, and, and not find people that have these dog tags that say things like, be strong and courageous, says the Lord. You know, when you're in the military, there are times you're scared. And you need to be able to look at something to remind yourself that the Lord's with you. And they've had these for a number of years until just recently somebody said, hey, wait, I don't like the fact that these soldiers and airmen and marines, I, I don't like the fact that they can have these dog tags. And believe it or not, the administration has said, yeah, we're banning the dog tags. You say, well, why? What, what is their rationale? We don't have to guess. They put it in a letter to us about four weeks ago. It's because this has religious things on it. So you can wear anything you want around your neck as long as it's not a scripture verse. Okay, well, that's unconstitutional. And that's unacceptable for those who serve us in the military. And we're not going to stop until we get a victory for them. And they can wear that around their neck if they so please. So this is now some of you are like, gosh, you know, Memorial Day weekend. I was kind of looking forward to a break. And, and then, I, you know, I had some coffee. I came to church. And now I'm depressed. Um, <laughs> So let me tell you the good news. The good news is we have a method of dealing with this. It's not like a theory. We've been doing it for decades, and it's successful. And that is if you look at nonprofit legal groups in the country, and I don't care if they're left wing or right wing or what their issue is, they have the same model. Raise as much money as you can raise. Use that money to hire as many attorneys as you can. Put them in an office in D.C. or L.A. or New York, and then send them around the country and cover as many cases as you can cover. That's not our model. Our model is there's all these believers who went to law school because they wanted to stand for what was right. They wanted to ride in on the white horse and the saber and save the day. And 30 years later, these are now the best litigators at the best law firms in the country, really the best law firms in the world. And they've done honorable work for those who they represented, but they've never gotten to do a case for the kingdom. So we go and sit down with those best of the best, and we say, look, if we give you everything you need, are you willing to give your time on one of these cases? And they're like, sign me up. I've been waiting for 35 years. Well, we know what's going to happen when we give them that first case. For the first time in their life, all their talent, all their training, everything they've learned in their litigation years, everything for the first time in their life is lined up with the kingdom. They have never felt that before. And it's kind of unfair, but we now know we have them for the rest of their lives as one of our volunteer attorneys. <laughs> And they give cover to the younger attorneys. They get permission to work underneath them on the case. They taste what it's like. You go through the top 100 law firms in the United States, most of those law firms don't just only their time, they'll fight each other. We'll, we'll have six or seven attorneys that charge $1,500, $2,000 an hour all in one case. No one would ever pay for that, but they're all donating their time. In fact, they're saying, you've got to let me work on this case. And the result of that is twofold average case we do every 10,000 we spend we get 60,000 donated so we're literally it's like the loaves and the fish okay it's God multiplying his resources but secondly and this is what we didn't count on is the win-loss ratio if you watch nonprofit legal groups they're fighting big enemies the government industry etc if they're really good they might win 40 percent of their cases 
22 years in a row, every single year, we won over 90% of our cases. And you could only do this if you were the body of Christ. I mean, if we have a case in Idaho, our attorney lives in Idaho, is one of the top litigators in Idaho, is at the best law firms in Idaho. When he walks into court and looks at the judge, they were in first grade together and lost a tooth together. Okay? And, you know, we can put together teams, dream teams, in 30 minutes anywhere in the country. The only reason we can do that is because we have the largest law firm in the world. It's called the Body of Christ Law Firm. And the result of this is just fascinating to watch how this works. These attorneys are dying on the vine. They're looking for finally to be able to use their gifts. They're thrilled for the first time in their life. It's, it's meaningful to them. The client, who is this aggrieved person in the body that needs the protection of the hand, is getting the protection of the hand. Okay, Attorneys they can never hire. And the result of this whole process is precedent that's set that protects everybody in the body. It's exactly how God's design is in Scripture. And so it's a blessing. So normally I would say, all right, we're done. Uh, awesome news. We're doing great. 300 cases last year. They're, you know, unfortunately, the attacks are growing, but we're winning. But actually, I want to tell you a little bit about the future. Uh, what do I see? Short term, long term. Because last time when I was here, I said, we're literally beginning to change history. Well, it's now happened. We have changed history. And so my view of the future with regard to religious freedom in this country is more positive than any time in my life. And I've been doing this for 32 years. Um, why do I say that? Well, when this Trump guy got elected, because we're all about advancing religious freedom, whoever's president. When he got elected, we said, how can we advance religious freedom best under this administration? We immediately saw these judicial seats open, 132 judicial seats. We said, you know what? If we can get good judges on the court, that'll really change the future for religious freedom. So we started working on that. We opened a whole division to vet everybody they're considering, to look into everything, to make sure we had the right kind of people. The result has been unbelievable. 234 judges appointed for life across the country. And I'm telling you, I don't, there's no way for me to show you each of these people. We have flooded the zone with strong believers who are brilliant, who are committed to the Constitution and their faith in a way where they will never turn. And they're on for 30, 40 years. Youngest ever appointed. What do I mean? Uh, I think we got a picture of uh, this guy on the left. That's just an example. Matt Kazmarek. Who's Matt? 38 years old, appointed to be a federal judge the rest of his life. He worked at First Liberty, okay? Brilliant, conservative. <laughs> he will never turn from the Constitution, First Amendment. Well, who's swearing him in? Probably the brightest lawyer in the country, uh, a guy who is one of our most active volunteer attorneys in the country, who is now at the Federal Court of Appeals right underneath the Supreme Court and is considered maybe one of the next picks on the Supreme Court. Uh, I could just multiply this over and over across. These are the kind of people we've put in the courts. And when you do that, what starts to happen is the decisions start to change. You know, they actually, they're originalists. They actually believe to look to the, you should look to the original meaning of the text. What a concept. Well, guess what happens when you do that with religious freedom? You start being taken back to what the founders said about our religious freedom. Not something that some court 50 years ago with a bunch of liberals that were trying to rewrite the Constitution said. And so if you would have asked me five years ago, there, there's a major decision under both religion clauses which has caused great damage to religious freedom for the past 50 years. If you'd have said, can you get rid of those? I'd have said, not in my lifetime. But we can chip away at them. I'm watching both of those precedents being exploded right now. And, and so, example, Coach Kennedy. I mentioned Coach Kennedy. There's a case under the Free Exercise Clause called the Smith case, which just eviscerated the Free Exercise Clause. If you're in my industry and you bring a free speech, you bring a religious liberty claim, you bring a free speech claim, and you say it's religious speech. That's how you get protection, because the Free Exercise Clause is of no use to you, which is ridiculous. So we have the Coach Kennedy case. Coach, who was fired. We uh, went to the Supreme Court after the Ninth Circuit. He, unfortunately for Coach Kennedy, he lives in the Ninth Circuit, uh, which is out of San Francisco. Um, they said coaches are not allowed to pray in public if anybody can see them. Uh, not what the Constitution says, but it's what their Constitution says. Uh, and uh, we went to the Supreme Court. They said, hey, you know, we're sending this back down. We want some facts developed. Um, but then four of the justices, the conservative ones, this is before Amy Coney Barrett was even added, 
four justices said, by the way, we noticed that the first claim to reach us here was a free speech claim, not a free exercise claim. Maybe that's because of the Smith decision, which has caused so much damage to religious freedom over the past 35 years. But we haven't been asked to review that decision yet. Not subtle. Okay, and so most people now believe, with Amy Coney Barrett added, that we are about to blow up this bad decision in the future and restore free exercise to every American in the country. So that's one clause. The other clause is the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What does that mean? We don't want there to be an established church that tells us what we have to support and interferes with our religious freedom. But 50 years ago, liberal Warren Court said, no, 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 it means more than that. It means separation of church and state. It means if you're offended, you can bring lawsuits. You can't bring lawsuits if you're offended. Only in one instance, if you're offended by religion. So our whole lives, we've seen attacks on nativity scenes, on veterans memorials with a cross or a menorah, on Ten Commandments monuments, on all this attacks on religion. The founders would be appalled. But that's, it's that case, the Lemon case, from 50 years ago. So we get this new case a few years ago, the Bladensburg Cross, a cross that was put up almost 100 years ago by mothers who lost their sons in World War I. The American humanists brought a lawsuit saying, you can't have a cross in public like that. You've got to tear it down. At the Federal Court of Appeals, one of the judges said, why don't we just cut the arms off the cross? That way nobody will be offended. We want to tear it down. So we thought, I think we're going to have a problem at this court. And so sure enough, we went to the Supreme Court. And we realized at this point, we're looking, we, got, we have Justice Kavanaugh on the court. He's a very pro-religious freedom. He donated time with us as a young attorney on religious freedom. We've got Gorsuch. Um, we might can get rid of this lemon case. And so we argued to the court, not just save this cross, but let's get rid of lemon. We won that case 7-2, to two, but more importantly, 5-4, they said we are not following lemon anymore. We, for 50 years, we were going in this hostility to religion approach in the courts. We just totally turned. Okay, the presumption as a matter of law now is religious symbols in public are presumptively constitutional. Okay, that is a total change. So we're just at the beginning of something really great, in my opinion. I mean, we're just at the beginning of what I believe every American is about to have more religious freedom than they've ever had in their lifetime. Okay, and we're just at the beginning of that. The only thing that could do anything to that is something really drastic and radical and so that's why i'll move to the to the short term in the short it's the way i i would we had a board meeting not too long ago and i told my board i said i've never been more optimistic about the future but we have a short-term knife fight right ahead of us uh, the current administration has attacked religious freedom in numerous ways and you've seen these things there's things like the equality act that are moving through the house and the senate what is the equality act the Equality Act literally goes in and strips religious freedom from every American whenever there's any LGBT issue. You cannot use it as a defense. That's what the Equality Act does. So that means, uh, uh, you know, in housing, in employment, in every area of life, they cover everything, including your church. They come in here, they can tell you, you have to have our beliefs on discrimination, and religious freedom is no defense. So you think that's a violation of religious freedom? We plan to win these cases. We've filed a number already. We're going to be filing some. We think with the good judges on the court, we can win. So even though this attack is great, we, we feel confident. The dangerous thing is there's also an attempt at what's called court packing. Court packing is when you add justices to the Supreme Court to get to a number where you can get the political results you want to get to. Now, people, most people recognize that's a really kind of bad idea. They don't understand how bad an idea. In every other country where they've done this, you lose your country very quickly. Because what you've just done is you've taken the judicial branch, the independent judicial branch, with the rule of law, and you've put it under the political branch. Your, your judiciary is now over. And you now have whatever rights the majority party will allow you to have because they can add however many justices they need to get whatever right taken away from you they wish to. It, uh, Venezuela is a great example. Venezuela did this 
in 2004, and you've seen what's happened to Venezuela. Uh, experts say the only reason Venezuela went the way they did because of court packing. Uh, there's been 45,000 opinions by the Venezuela court since then. Zero against the government. Okay? We tried this in the United States in 1936 and 37. FDR, one of those popular presidents ever, um, he didn't like the fact that his New Deal was being thwarted a little bit by the Supreme Court. So he said, We're gonna, I'm going to add some justices. And you know, he tried to do that. Again, 80 of the Senate, 80 Democrats, 20 Republicans. Okay? His own party turned against him because the country arose and said, this is tyranny. This should never happen in the United States. We will never allow court packing. And they stopped him. They were averaging, 1937, 1,000 letters a day in the senator's offices. Okay? You think, well, it won't happen. I think we've got a quick video. Let me, this is just a minute. If you think this is not a problem, not a possibility. President Roosevelt clearly had the right to send to the United States Senate and the United States Congress a proposal to pack the court. But it was a bonehead idea. They'll know my opinion of court packing when the election is over. Now look, I know it's a great question. So I'll put together a national commission of scholars and I will, uh, Ask them to come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system. This is a live ball. Oh, it is a live ball. So we will figure out a way to get something done. Well, let's take a look and see. Everything is on the table. We're going to add five, six, seven, ten seats to the court. Well, I think everything's on the table. Everything is on the table. All of those matters will be on the table. All options are on the table. And as I've said, everything, everything is on the table. Presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices stay for generations. Again, you're probably aware uh, the president uh, issued an executive order, announced a commission to reform the United States Supreme Court. It is now meeting, had its first public meeting uh, a week ago, and uh, they're going to come with conclusions in five months. Uh, there's been a bill uh, filed in the House to add four justices to the Supreme Court. Uh, this is a live ball. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that we stop this. If people are educated, they realize how bad this is. And no matter what side of the aisle they're on, this destroys our courts. And so uh, we've got a website called SupremeCoup.com. It's got tons of information. Uh, you, our ads are starting to run this weekend on Fox and Newsmax and MSNBC and all these different places because people have to be educated and make sure we don't make a mistake we really can't uh, uh, overcome. So my summary of all this is the future is actually incredible as long as we take care of what's right in front of us. And somewhat, it's up to us and us being faithful, educating our friends, doing what we can do. Uh, and so I want to end with a uh, video. This is our one of our most recent clients and uh, recent cases and she's a woman who slowly went blind, and as she was going blind, realized the most important thing to her was that people know about Jesus. And uh, you'll see her story, and then I want to tie that to us here at the end. Nursing was it for me. It was my identity. I did everything. If I could help them get a job or an apartment, my husband says that I am a um, frustrated social worker. <laughs> January 7th, 1984, I actually had been going to a Bible study on the book of John, and uh, it opened my heart to the Word of God being the answer, the truth. It was the best day of my life. I actually was born with a genetic disorder, retinitis pigmentosa, and I still continued nursing until I couldn't anymore because of my vision loss. If somebody says, if ever said to me, hey, you could have your eyesight, but you have to, you know, get rid of Jesus, I'd say, no, no deal. Wherever I go, I try to hand this out to people. So it's 21 chapters of the gospel. I get around with my cane to cross the street to go in the park. Going into a park to uh, talk with people is a pleasure, first of all. But knowing that eternal life is real and people don't know that they're in danger, people have been 
saved in the park. I've had more of a reaction from the staff on, in the park that was not too nice, uh, like they would interrupt me. There's plenty of people to talk to. I don't have to be um, going after anybody. I couldn't. It would be a tripping hazard for me. I was sitting on a bench with a, a man that I was conversing with. The executive director comes over and he says that he was going to call the police and uh, that's the start of um, the two-year ban, even from the library, which that was a little bit of a surprise to me, that they would ban me from both the park and the library on passing out one of the 66 books of the Bible that you have in your library that people can check out. Uh, I guess my heart is broken uh, that I can't do what the Lord has told me to do. So if you want to say that, I, I think about daily the lost souls. I think the Lord has positioned me right across from the park. It, it's a divine uh, assignment that I absolutely need to fulfill. It's, it's just a must. First, uh, I mean, I know a number of you have been involved with this for years. Thank you for being a part of Gail's case and so many other cases. And uh, if you're not, I hope you'll get involved just so you can pray for and get behind people like Gail and others. Uh, but I thought it's a good example of, you know, she could have just, Gail could have just let it happen. But she didn't. She stood her ground. She spoke the truth. She stood up. And the result is we, you know, as you might guess, we won her case. Um, and uh, she just reached out to let us know uh, that uh, somebody had just accepted the Lord in the park, uh, which would have never happened. <laughs> would have never happened if she didn't stand up. And in fact, she's also let us know that uh, the guy who turned her in at the park is now coming to her church. <laughs> so, so the question is, what, what does this all mean to you? What can we do? Well, number one, I would encourage you, if you're not connected to us and the cases and things that are going on, I would encourage you to do that. A lot of you are. But it's an easy way. If you want to text the word liberty to 474747, we'll send you a little link that you can fill out. And you'll get an email once a week, and you'll, you'll be able to pray about these things so you're not going to see these things otherwise. And you'll also be a person that can educate other people around you. Because if you don't have the information, you know, it's hard for you to educate people as to what's going on. I think there's so many wins that people don't know about, and it emboldens people to stand more for their faith if they know about all these victories. So uh, that's one thing. But the other thing is, it's kind of simple. It's kind of back to what I talked about, uh, live not by lies, which is... Everybody in this room can stand and speak the truth. Uh, and we all have opportunities right now. We're surrounded by nonsense. I mean, crazy stuff, you know? And everybody's wondering, is anybody going to say the emperor has no clothes? And that's, that's what, that really is our job right now. You know, I sent a, a text message this morning to a friend of mine who headed Delta Force and has, had bullets that big go through his body and really served our country. And I just thanked him for what he done for our country. I thought, with what, on Memorial Day, with what people have given for us to have freedom, I think the least we can do is stand and speak the truth. Amen. Especially since that's what Jesus calls us to do. Uh, so really, what a privilege that we get to live in this time where the future is going to depend upon whether we have the courage to lovingly stand and speak truth in a crazy culture. Uh, and anyway, I want to thank you for the privilege of letting me come here. Uh, it's one of my favorite places in the universe, and uh, just really appreciate y'all. God bless you.